Good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, I have, uh, I don't have anything off the top. Um, so Daphne, you want to kick us off? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Prime, Prime Minister Netanyahu said today that Israel will carry out an operation against Hamas in uh, Rafah, regardless of whether or not. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, regardless of whether or not a ceasefire and hostage release deal is reached, is it still the case that the U.S. hasn't seen a credible plan for entering Rafah? And what will you do if they go ahead, as Netanyahu is warning? That that is that is correct. We uh, ha continues to be the case that we have not seen a, a credible plan that uh, would address the varying areas of concerns that you've heard me talk about a number of times from up here and others. Uh, primarily, uh, the ability uh, to address the serious humanitarian concerns surrounding uh, again, Raf is a, a region with more than one million people seeking refuge. It's an area that continues to be an important conduit for humanitarian aid as well as a safe departure for foreign nationals. Uh, and so, any kind of operation that's that does not address some of these key concerns uh, would certainly be uh, uh, opposed by us um, I'm not going to get into uh, any hypotheticals uh, but this is something we're continuing to engage with our partners in Israel conversations continue to be um, happening um, at, at all levels and, and continue to uh, to press forward on those conversations and um, asking for uh, what their plans uh, may or may not be as it pertains to Rafa and are you concerned that this warning that they would go ahead with whether or not a ceasefire and hostage deal is reached could derail hostage talks? Uh, I'm not going to speculate on that. I, what I can say, Daphne, is that we remain committed to reaching a deal for the immediate, uh, uh, for an immediate ceasefire that it secures the release of hostages and uh, uh, allows for uh, additional steps to be taken in terms of uh, surging humanitarian aid uh, and something that we hope will, will help bolster the protection of civilians as well. Follow up on that? Yeah, uh, uh, Israel's track record in, in heeding to the U.S. Uh, statements or calls uh, could be arguably not great. Uh, what gives you confidence or what makes you think that Israel would in fact listen and hear your calls not to going to Rafa. I dispute the, the, the premise of that a little bit, Leon. Um, over the course of this conflict, there have been a number of endeavors in which uh, the United States has pressed for um, that we have seen our partners in Israel undertake, uh, dating back to uh, the beginning of this conflict even, uh, in the early days of, of this conversation that we were having around humanitarian aid. We also continue to see steps uh, being taken uh, as it relates to their cooperation on a number of other lines of efforts in the humanitarian aid space. Uh, but both, look, when it comes to humanitarian aid, when it comes to the protection of civilians, uh, and when it comes to a potential um, operation in Rafah, uh, our answer continues to be we need to see more. We need to uh, see more steps being taken. Um, and and as it relates to an operation in Rafa, we have yet to see a credible plan that would uh, address the uh, underlying concerns that I laid out uh, to Daphne. Uh, Olivia, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just because the secretary was also asked about this not long ago, he said yeah. that you know the, the U.S. views on this were well known, but he didn't address part of the question that whether Israel had in fact committed to present a military and humanitarian plan. So absent the plans themselves. Has there been a formal commitment from the Israeli government to present those plans before launching any ground invasion? Uh, I'm not going to be a spokesperson for the government of Israel through the strategic consultative group that you have seen um, National Security Advisor Sullivan and Secretary Blinken undertake their consultations with counterparts in Israel, discussions um, at those levels and through other interlocutors as part of those engagements, those conversations are ongoing. Uh, as the Secretary said, the United States position on this uh, could not be clearer um, for how long we've been talking about this. We have expressed our serious concern about any kind of operation that does not address some of these key pieces uh, and will continue to stress and, and raise these very uh, important issues. Thank you. I mean, I totally appreciate not asking you for the Israeli perspective on this, only whether the U.S. has actually received a commitment from the government to have formal plans presented prior to any invasion. Uh, I'm just not going to speak to further specificity about this process. I have two others on the region. Uh, mind if I jump to Jillian? Is that, sure. And then we can, we'll, I'm sure we'll get to everybody. Go ahead. I'm just wondering <laughs> if um, State has any comments or any information, anything today on the, you know, the anti-Israel protests across 
you know, the nation now really going from California all the way to New York. Uh, but a lot of these student protesters are accusing the Biden administration of being complicit in genocide. I'm wondering if you got if diplomatically, sure. so, foreign policy wise, you guys. Have yeah. So I've I've spent um, a, a number of the last few daily press briefings talking about this, and I'm happy to to reiterate what I what I said before. First, I, I will echo what the secretary said um, in in talking to one of your colleagues uh, on the margins of his trip to Beijing. Uh, demonstrating, demonstrations, I should say, um, expressing your opinion about any kind of government action, expressing your opinion about foreign policy, uh, exercising your First Amendment right, um, none of those things are uh, problematic or anti-Semitic or Islamophobic um, in their own right. It is when those things are coupled with um, start the use of certain language and rhetoric and insults that we have seen and have been part of some of these demonstrations. Um, beyond that, uh, those kinds of things, of course, uh, we would condemn and take issue with. Uh, but we believe that every American has every right to express their points of view, to exercise their First Amendment right when it comes to policies that are that, that, that as it relate to any particular campus, those campus officials are better suited to speak to those policies that they have in place, both in terms of dealing with uh, expressions of, of, of First Amendment rights or otherwise. I'm not in a, in a, in a space to, to speak to that. But uh, of course, um, everyone has every right to uh, make their point of view heard. And from our perspective across this administration, we've made clear that um, we uh, insist that these happen in a peaceful, nonviolent uh, manner. And any kinds of these demonstrations, when they are paired with or coupled with uh, rhetoric, language um, that is anti Semitic, Islamophobic, uh, essentially insults or targets someone for just who they are, that's deeply problematic. Um, quick follow up. One yeah. thing that's kind of new, yeah. as far as I'm aware, mm -hmm. uh, is you're seeing regimes now like. The Iranian regime, China started to weigh in the governments and criticize the Biden administration's response to these protests. We saw overnight the Chinese saying that the way, I don't know, the U.S. government is responding is violating these uh, students' rights. Do you have a comment on so, the adversaries? Look, uh, the, opportunity the, the, the policies and procedures as it relates to demonstrations protesting, uh, things like that, that may or may not exist on a particular college campus or may or may not exist in a particular town, city, or municipality, it is certainly not in the remit of, of the State Department, so I am not going to uh, even delve into that. There's other agencies that are better suited to speak to that. But what I can say broadly, we of course uh, support um, uh, anybody uh, to be able to express themselves and to exercise their First Amendment rights. Uh, they should not. and cannot uh, become violent, uh, not peaceful. Uh, and in those particular circumstances, we believe it is the right of the appropriate law enforcement and uh, uh, enforcement and security officials to take appropriate actions consistent with the policies of that jurisdiction. Again, we are delving far away from foreign policy and into law enforcement, which is well, not the remit of, uh, no, of this No, because what I'm asking really is, is, is it not from a foreign policy, foreign relations, diplomacy perspective, isn't it, I mean, hypocritical of the Chinese and the Iranians, some of the worst human rights violators in the world to be criticizing the Biden administration's policy response? I don't think America? I don't think anybody in this administration is interested in taking a human rights uh, lesson from uh, the Iranian regime or the People's Republic of China, for that matter. And both of those regimes uh, crackdowns on uh, self-expression, on uh, free and fair press, on basic human rights is is clear. Um, yeah. Sorry, image, uh, just a quick, quick hold, follow hold up. Hold on, a hold, of on hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. The, the image that is given of the United States is, uh, is being arrested, uh, not necessarily the one you would want to have. Leon, there are laws in this uh, a country. Again, we are delving away from the topics that are discussed in this department. But if laws are being broken on certain college campuses, in certain municipalities, in certain towns, in certain cities, um, in certain counties, 
it is well within the right for the officials of those jurisdictions to enforce whatever laws that are so appropriate as it relates to that, that region. Beyond that, uh, we fully support anybody's ability to exercise their First Amendment right and make their uh, opinions as it relates to any action or policy the government may or may not be taking and making their points of view heard. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, I just have a couple of follow-ups and then I have a couple of questions of my own. Now, in response to Jill, you said there are certain things that are being said in these protests that you have issue with. Could you share some of those with us? I'm not going to uh, repeat them from but up here. You, you Saeed, made an but assertion that you, you, know, you are obviously in command of. What, what are these statements? Saeed, you know? there have been a number of, uh, of, of these demonstrations in which the imagery, right. in which the right. language that okay. has been written on some of the poster material right. has uh, either been akin to uh, what I would believe to be anti-Semitism, okay. uh, but we've also seen expressions, rhetoric, signage uh, that is akin to Islamophobia and the targeting of Arab American and Palestinian Americans as well. Uh, of course, any kind of language or rhetoric in that space uh, is concerning, troubling, and unacceptable. Uh, but again, uh, we fully support people's ability to peacefully make their, uh, express their First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. Now, on the statement by the Israeli Prime Minister on Rafah, mm -hmm. he's saying very plainly that whether there is a deal or there is no deal, I'm going to storm Rafa. And you don't have a position on this? I mean, he's not waiting for a deal. I think our position on Rafa, I, I, I really don't appreciate you side twisting my words or the words not. of the secretary or other officials I, up I'm, here. I am, We've I am made our point the, of view. The Prime Minister of I understand. I understand not. your question. Yeah. Uh, and in response to your question and Daphne's question and yeah, yeah. the number of times that we have asked, been asked about uh, a potential military operation into Rafa from up here, we have been unambiguous about uh, the concerns that we have when yeah. it comes to the more than a million people seeking refuge in that region, mm -hmm. when it comes to this region in particular in Gaza being an important conduit for the delivery of humanitarian aid, it being a region in which foreign nationals, uh, at least at the uh, beginning of this conflict, were able to use, uh, are able to use consistently for safe departure. So uh, any kind of operation that does not address these concerns mm -hmm. would be a non-starter for us. And mm -hmm. you've heard me say this, you've heard the secretary say this, You've heard Matt say this. You've heard Admiral Kirby, Kareen, the president. We have been consistent on this. Yeah. So would it be appropriate for the United States of America to say whether there is a deal or not a deal, we find that the storm of the Rafa is unacceptable? I, we have been pretty clear about that. Very clearly. We have been We have been very clear that a many, any kind of military operation into Rafa that does not address these concerns would be unacceptable to the United States. Right. Now, I have a question on the humanitarian situation. Uh -huh. Officials at the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, uh, leaked a, uh, they leaked a document that says that the Israeli government intently, you know, uh, sort of um, puts obstacles in the way of these uh, humanitarian aid convoys or whatever. Uh, getting through to, to Gaza. Are you aware of that report? So I'm just not going to comment on leaked documents, Said. Uh, wh why won't you comment on those documents? I, I'm not going to comment uh, on leaked documents, on uh, things that continue to exist under a deliberative process. I will uh, just say that the secretary and the leaders of this administration, they hear a diverse range of views uh, from across this department, from across the interagency. Uh, when it comes to uh, processes that are within the deliberative process, we take those points of view into consideration consideration, but beyond that, I'm just not going to uh, speak to uh, uh, purportedly leaked documents. Okay. Would you, would you agree that uh, there is a, almost a common opinion uh, among professionals and experts and so on that Israel is, in fact, and the Prime Minister of Israel are, in fact, take measures day after day to uh, sort of make these humanitarian aids, including American, I would just, of American I, aid. I, I would disagree with your characterization. Julia. Thank you. Um, I know the State Department and, and Secretary Blinken have made clear that the ICC uh, doesn't have jurisdiction, uh, in your view, over uh, the Palestinian conflict. Um, but I wanted to get your response to remarks from Netanyahu uh, just today, um, especially in context of the conversation we just had about the campus protests. He said, branding Israel's leaders and soldiers as war criminals will pour jet fuel on the fires of anti-Semitism those fires that are already raging on the campuses of America and across capitals around the world. Do you agree with that assessment that it, it's anti-Semitic for the ICC to 
pursue Netanyahu? And what do you make of him connecting this to the protests? So uh, fundamentally, at, at the heart of this, uh, Julia, we do not believe that the ICC has uh, jurisdiction uh, over this issue. And that's what the crux here. Beyond that, I'd, I'd let the prime minister and officials within the Israeli government clarify or offer any commentary on his comments. But at the crux of this for the United States is that we do not believe that the ICC has jurisdiction on this. That being said, we work closely with the ICC in a number of key areas. Uh, we think that they do important work, uh, important work as it relates to uh, Ukraine, Darfur, Sudan. Uh, but again, on this uh, particular incident, instance, in this particular instance, I'm sorry, um, they just do not have uh, jurisdiction. And, and then, if I may, another mm -hmm. on uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah. There have been reports um, that Saudi Arabia has decided to normalize relations with Israel, but is uh, waiting to determine when they do that based on the U.S. election and the results of the election. Um, what do you make of Saudi Arabia potentially weighing this presidential election so much when the urgency is now? So I would, I defer to officials in the Saudi government to speak to their uh, position. I'm not a, a spokesperson for them. Uh, what I can say from the United States is that um, we also have been unambiguous about how uh, we feel that a greater, a more integrated Middle East region is better for uh, not just the interests of the United States, but it is better for peace and stability um, in the Middle East region. It is also something that we believe um, other officials across the uh, Middle East region and Arab world uh, view this as well. We are continuing to work this. We think that uh, Israel's further integration in the Middle East region can unlock uh, additional benefits. Um, it can offer greater security, uh, which is in the interest of the United States. It's in the interest of the people of Israel, and it's also in the interest of other partners uh, as well. Uh, but of course, uh, we also are continuing to stress and underlie the importance of, of doing everything we can to reaching a deal uh, for an immediate ceasefire, one that releases the hostages, uh, one that allows a surge of humanitarian aid um, into the region as well. Uh, go ahead, Nadia. Um, I don't know if somebody asked you about this or not, but I want to ask you about the Amnesty International report. Go ahead. Okay. I... So basically, Amnesty just published its report. I don't know if you've seen it in details. But they say there is a reasonable evidence that Israel has committed war crimes, uh, vi gross violation of international of uh, human rights, and violation of international humanitarian law. I'm just wondering, I mean, with something as serious as this from a very reputable organization that normally use it to talk about rogue states, etc., when they're finding and they publish their reports. Why the State Department still now has not published anything um, to either contradict or to support other human rights or organizations being talking about what's happening in Gaza? So uh, first, I've not seen that specific report, Nadia, but uh, I think you were in the briefing room just about a week and a half ago in which we un un when we unveiled the 2024 um, human rights report in which there was in fact uh, a, a section um, outlining uh, Israel and the Palestinian territories. Uh, when it comes to the current conflict in Gaza, and I've spent a number of days talking about this, uh, we are continuing to assess uh, what is happening on the ground. Uh, we have a number of tools at our disposal to uh, look into what is happening on the ground, and if required, um, hold appropriate and relevant parties accountable. You have heard us talk uh, a great deal in this briefing room about Leahy. You've heard us talk a great deal in this briefing room about the CHURG process. Uh, we continue to have those options as well as other avenues under uh, the, the Foreign Assistance Act to uh, look into these things. And as in any conflict zone, Nadia, this work is ongoing, and we are feeding into that process in close coordination with not just our embassies and consulates, but also civil society, uh, independent media reporting of such things, uh, and of course, uh, NGOs as well. Can you just assure us that actually um, you treat Israel the same way as you treat any other country that found in violation of international law because um, what we hear from you is all the statements and some actions, like we see with the settlers. But many believe that when the Prime Minister of Israel pick up the phone, call the White House, the finding is changed and delayed and pushed, just like we heard about even the Secretary. We were together in, on, uh, in Italy when he assured us that we're going to hear about this report 
about the Leahy report and the violation of using U.S. weapons, but we haven't heard about it. So I just wanted an assurance from you that actually well, I spent, this thing is serious. I spent about 50% of the daily press briefing yesterday talking about it, so I would take issue with, with, with how you laid that out. Um, there are absolutely, we hold uh, Israel uh, to the same standard that we hold any country with, uh, and that is with um, in Gaza, outside of Gaza, anywhere, international law, international humanitarian law needs to be followed and it needs to be abided by. And when we find violations or when we find issues that are concerning, not only do we raise them with the Israeli government, we will take appropriate actions consistent with the systems and tools that we have uh, in the United States um, to take appropriate actions. I spent a great deal of yesterday talking about the Leahy process in which we found um, five violations of uh, gross violations of human rights. Um, so when we see issues, uh, we will not hesitate to take appropriate action. There is no different standard or different set of rules uh, when it comes to any country uh, on which we have a relationship. Okay, with. just one final yeah. clarification. The secretary said that the offer they give to Hamas is generous. Um, who decide what is generosity? Is it the United States and Israel? What does it, is it Arab partners in the Saudi summit that they decide is generous? I mean, I, I guess my question, how do you define what is generous? So, Nadia, over how the course different? of this conflict, we have seen uh, Hamas uh, move the goalpost, um, uh, renege on uh, agreements that they have made uh, as it has relates to part of this deal. Um, and so the secretary was simply underlining the fact that uh, we are in this position in which um, it, Hamas has a generous offer on the table uh, and it's imperative for them to move and to act on it as swiftly as possible. Livia, go ahead. Um, yeah. Just one point of clarification on Leahy, which I know you um, amply addressed yesterday, but you mentioned yesterday that the process was open-ended, right? It was subject to the MOU that exists between the, Isra between the Israeli government and the United States. This new information that Israel has provided with regard to the fifth unit, is can it continuously supply new information with regard to that unit un, until the U.S. sort of adjudicates in a particular direction, or is this a finite set of information on whose basis the U.S. will decide whether to take punitive? I would say the information is uh, uh, is, is is definitive, and it is uh, more that consistent with the memorandum of understanding that we have. Um, we are bound by that to consult and engage uh, with officials in Israel um, on the process, on um, steps that they uh, may or may not uh, be taking. Uh, and we are assessing all of those things uh, to ensure that um, they are in standard with what is laid out in the Leahy law. And if not, as I heard said yesterday, there will of course be a resistance of applicable, uh, a restriction on applicable U.S. assistance. Okay. And then yeah. a separate question. Question on aid. Yeah. Um, the secretary from Jordan earlier mentioned the opening of new crossings into northern Gaza. I was hoping you could just update us on the overall metrics, on the volume of aid that's going in, and how that compares to what the U.S. believes is necessary. So, look, uh, we are still very much in the same place that uh, we were when David Satterfield came and talked to you all. We have seen some uh, measurable steps in the right direction. Uh, Northern crossings, uh, including Erez and uh, Zakim, are preparing to reopen. Um, we are um, seeing that uh, routes from uh, Jordan and Ashdod are showing progress, uh, but not fully yet realized. Uh, and so Southern Crossing, specifically Karim Shalom uh, and Rafa, have seen um, some fluctuating uh, numbers of trucks, but trending in the right direction. This is all to say that uh, we still need to see more. Uh, and some metrics that I can offer is that um, April 25th, on April 25th, uh, approximately 303 trucks entered Gaza, according to the UN, 282 trucks via Karim Shalom, and 21 trucks uh, via Rafa. Um, 
that is not nearly enough, but it is a step in the right direction. We want to continue to see more. I know also we spend a lot of time up here talking about uh, trucks and their inflows and outflows, uh, possibly because it might be the most digestible uh, metric out there it is when they're talking about this issue. But ultimately, when we talk about humanitarian aid, um, it is great to see uh, trucks enter Gaza. It is even better when the humanitarian aid it, that enters Gaza is getting to the Palestinian people, to Palestinian civilians who need it. And we will continue to work closely with the government of Egypt, government of Jordan, government of Israel, and relevant NGO partners, including the United Nations, uh, to ensure that that final step is happening and it's getting to the places it needs to go. Um, go ahead. I've asked several times about um, uh, the right to defend oneself for Palestinians. Um, and out of this room, we've heard that the US does not exhibit any double st double standards. And today in the West Bank, there were, uh, the Israeli occupation forces uh, chased, beat, uh, and, and threw off a roof a 32-year-old man, Palestinian man, Hassan Mansiyah. Uh, near uh, in the Hebron district. Um, also, um, the Israeli forces uh, attacked at least two schools with tear gas, um, two inside and outside schools in the Hebron and uh, Janine districts, uh, where students were and teachers, and you know some of them experienced some suffocation. Um, you know, since October seventh, we've, I mean, we've had like what is it, 95 miners that have been killed in the West Bank. I asked before, do the Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? I'm not talking about rogue individuals. I'm talking about as far as a legal uh, authority to defend Palestinians. Do they, does the State Department view that Palestinians have a right and duty to defend themselves. So, look, I have not seen uh, those reports that you outlined. I'm happy to, to look into them, and I have no doubt our uh, partners in the uh, IDF may be able to, to share more. What I can say is that actions like these, um, if true, uh, they are destabilizing. Uh, they uh, contribute, contribute to a deteriorating security situation, uh, and they are not in the interest of Israel's uh, own security. Um, and when we have seen actions like this, when we see actions from, uh, we believe quite strongly that these kinds of activities take us away uh, from a two-state solution and they feed into further instability. Okay. Uh, but that, does, the, does, the, does the Palestinian Authority have the right to defend its citizens? Absolutely it does. Absolutely it does. It does. Okay. Go ahead. Follow up on the campus protest uh, yeah. question. You know, the U.S. government, everybody from President Biden on down to here at the podium has been quick to call out anti-Semitism at these protests, but there's also been an enormous number of examples of Islamophobia and racism from counter-protesters. Why doesn't the administration denounce that as well? And would I you did. do that here? You can check the transcript. I did. Well, uh, and let me ask you about uh, Net Netanyahu's, mm -hmm. the news on Netanyahu today, mm -hmm. uh, where he said, that even if there's a hostage deal, they're still going Ryan, to you gotta be on time. You got to come to the briefing you, on time. You get asked about that, that too. Come on, man. Uh, okay. uh -huh. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Um, uh, today, uh, photos of pair in Gaza were published. Uh, my question, will the Palestinian Authority PA be the one who will control this pair? Sorry. Uh, the, uh, the port. Uh-huh. Uh, today, I, uh, there is uh, photos of this port published. Uh, I wonder if the PA, the Palestinian Authority, will control this uh, port in Gaza? Uh, I do not believe that the uh, Palestinian Authority has a, a role in um, the, the, the maritime corridor, but I am um, happy to defer you to my colleagues at the Defense Department and USAID to speak to this process in a little bit more specificity. Don't, uh, just, don't you think this port will build over the Palestinian territories, and uh, should Palestinian uh, uh, people have the authority of uh, this port? So, broadly, when we are talking about the future of Gaza and the future of a two-state solution and ensuring that Gaza is no longer a launch pad for uh, terrorism against the Israeli people, uh, part of that for us, of course, uh, includes a uh, Gaza that is uh, reunited under the Palestinian Authority. But as it relates to this uh, maritime corridor, um, um, I, 
I do not believe that they have a specific role. Uh, but that being said, my colleagues at uh, the Pentagon and USAID may be in a better place to speak to some of the more logistical components of this. Okay. Go ahead, in the back. Thank you, Vidanka. Um, I just wanted to ask about the Aras border crossing. Sure. Um, it's obviously reopening in the north weeks after POSIS's call with Netanyahu. What should we read into the timing of this opening, considering that Blinken is now there to request more aid and also this ceasefire deal hangs in the balance? I would not read anything into the, the timing of this beyond uh, us just stressing again that all of these things uh, need to happen as swiftly as possible. But we also fully understand that um, there may be steps that need to be taken in when factoring in vetting, safety, uh, other things uh, as it relates to crossings that are used for the inflow of aid. Uh, we are not naive to the fact that this is a process, but look, we have uh, been clear that we need uh, this to happen as swiftly as possible. And I just want to um, touch on some of the other questions as well. Yeah. Was it the U.S.'s aim to try to beat the clock on a rougher invasion by getting this ceasefire deal in place beforehand? And if so, have Netanyahu's comments this morning altered that at all? It's, it's not about beating any clock. We, if you go back and look at the history and trajectory of this conflict, um, there have been a number of instances in which we have uh, been hoping, encouraging, uh, working tirelessly uh, for a deal that would release the hostages that we hope would be uh, uh, partnered with some kind of uh, ceasefire. That has been our position for quite some time. And simultaneously, as it relates to Rafa, it has also been our position for quite some time that any kind of operation that does not address the sort of various components of humanitarian concern that we have uh, would be uh, unacceptable uh, to us. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, go ahead in the back. Thank you yeah. so much. Any comment on John Bass trip to Doha and Islamabad? Uh, was the meeting with Taliban official in his schedule? So, uh, uh, as you so noted, uh, Acting Undersecretary uh, for Political Affairs John Bass is on travel to uh, Doha and Islamabad. Um, in Doha, he'll meet with senior Qatari officials and other diplomatic uh, missions to discuss support for Afghanistan and other shared security interests in the region and in Islamabad. Uh, we expect him to meet with senior Pakistani officials and discuss a range of regional and bilateral issues as well. Hello. Go ahead, next. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know the State Department already talked about the Kurdistan region's local elections yeah. some time ago, as it has been scheduled for June 10th. So now there's a discussion that should be postponed for at least uh, three months. So what's your comment? So we understand that President uh, Barzani and various Iraqi authorities um, and other political parties are actively considering next steps. Uh, from our point of view, we would encourage them to schedule free, fair, and timely elections, uh, and we hope that process takes place. But I don't have anything to offer beyond that. Gita, go ahead. Thank you for that. I have yeah. two questions on two separate topics. Great. Uh, <laughs> um, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner on Saturday, the President called on Putin to release RFERL uh, journalist also Gormasheva. I was wondering if, um, if the State Department is following up her case uh, into seeing whether she's been, uh, she can be ca uh, identified as wrongfully detained. So first, let me just say we have no higher priority than the safety and security of U.S. citizens overseas. And in the case of Alsu Kurmasheva, we remain deeply concerned about her detention in Russia. And to um, echo the president, uh, we believe she should be uh, released. And we condemn in the strongest possible terms the Kremlin's continued attempts to intimidate, uh, repress, and punish journalists and other civil society actors. Uh, in terms of a wrongful detention designation, uh, I'm just not going to get ahead of our process. There is a uh, deliberative and fact-driven process underway. That process uh, continues to be uh, ongoing, and we constantly review uh, circumstances uh, surrounding detentions of U.S. nationals, so I don't have anything to, to offer there. How often? Can you tell us how often you may review I, cases? We have, I am not going to speak to the specifics of this process. Okay, another one um, mm -hmm. on Burkina Faso. Yeah. Voice of America and BBC have been banned there. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if the State Department is doing anything in that regard. So uh, we are very alarmed that Burkina Faso's Superior Council of Communications has suspended multiple uh, independent outlets, including 
Voice of America and BBC uh, for covering uh, the Human Rights Watch report about uh, some recent massacres. You've heard the Secretary say, and including from this very podium, that far too many governments uh, use repression to silence uh, free expression, particularly against journalists and media organizations, for simply doing their jobs. Uh, freedom of expression, particularly for media, is critical for accountable and transparent uh, governance. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Madam. Go ahead, Alex. Thank you, Madam. You're, you're, you're interrupting your colleague, Shalil. This is my third time. You're, I'm happy to come to you. I'm happy to come to you after. Alex, go ahead. Thanks so much, Madam. Keep this clear of either validate or kill alive some of the reports uh, claiming that the U.S. has eased some of the sanctions on Russian banks, including the central bank, to allow some energy-related operations. Why? I'm not sure what reports you're referring to, Alex. Uh, what I can just say broadly, though, is that when it comes to uh, our efforts to hold the Russian Federation accountable for its infringement on the territorial integrity and sovereignty of our Ukrainian partners, uh, we have not uh, taken our foot off the gas going back to February of 2022 since this invasion occurred, and we will continue to take steps uh, both to continue to support our Ukrainian partners, but also through sanctions, export controls, and other measures, hold the Russian Federation accountable. So there is no shift at all? There is no policy shift at all. Thank you. Thank you. And Poland, Poland today handed official request to the United States to host nuclear weapons in Poland. Do you have any reaction? Uh, I don't have any uh, comment for you on that. I'm sure my colleagues at the Pentagon can speak to that greater. Sure, thanks so much. And right. final topic on uh, Armenia Azerbaijan. Uh -huh. Secretary spoke with uh, both leaders uh, over the weekend. Any reason to why you know he called this? Any, any like intel or any concern did he want to convey? And separately on Azerbaijan on human rights, portion of the you know uh, discussion was about human rights. But hours after that call, Azerbaijan arrested another civil society leader. So how much is it the reflection of functional relationship? So uh, first, let me just say, Alex, it should come no, to no surprise to you that this is uh, a, an area of the world that the secretary himself is personally deeply engaged on. Um, and over the course of his time as secretary, he has had regular engagements um, at regular intervals with both of these countries. And our engagements with both of them are ongoing. Um, and we continue to believe that a, uh, a, a, a peace and, uh, is possible here. And that's something that we're going to continue to work towards. On the second question that you raised, we are deeply uh, troubled by the continuing arrests of uh, members of Azerbaijani civil society. Most recently, Anar um, Mamadali, and we urge the Azerbaijani government to immediately release all individuals who are unjustly detained. Jaleel, go ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Dudant, and thank you very much. The State Department for bearing with these nine years. Uh, just one question, and then if you allow me, I'll ask another question. How do you feel uh, when journalists here uh, are friends with the same podium people from the U.S. since last two decades, and you guys, this administration, since last two years, if a journalist doesn't agree, agree with you, you just ignore them? I mean, this is the beauty of this newsroom. This is the beauty of this press room. Why are you guys like, you guys not feel bad to be treating somebody like this? Like, what's the I'm, I'm sorry, who are we treating in what way? I'm talking about this, this gentleman right here. Since last two years. Did something happen to you? Sir, I feel very ignored. I ask one question and you pass me. You guys don't get it. First another. of all, uh, it is never a guarantee that everyone gets a question every day. Uh, we try our best to get to everybody, but sometimes we're dealing with uh, the, the confines of time. And I will just say, Jaleel, in my time up here and Matt's time and Ned's time, we have taken questions from you pretty regularly. Yeah, I don't agree, but anyway, Rabia, thank you very much. Ahead. I just have a question for about You just uh, my used your one question. So I'm gonna move I'm gonna move on now. Go so ahead. I had a follow up okay. question on That's Kabul fine. expansionism. The undersecretary is going there. The region has terrorism going then on. Then you half should of the ask that question, is, Jaleel. Then half you should... of Afghanistan is under no education for girls. The undersecretary is going how do you feel talking to a nation? where terrorism is once again growing up. Today in Kabul, six people were killed. Every week there is terrorism. Why is the undersecretary holding talks with the Taliban if the girls do not have education? And what's your interest there? So let me just say a couple things. First, I, I, I will just, since you've gotten us way off topic, if you have a question, you should ask a question, not uh, waste your colleagues' time about uh, other things. Secondly, um, I'm not aware of any travel to uh, Afghanistan uh, by any undersecretary. But 
let me just say that when it Doha, comes man. to our engagements with uh, uh, the Taliban, we engage when it is in the United States' interest to do so. This is the best way to not just protect U.S. national interests, uh, but also support the Afghan people. Engagement allows us to speak directly with the Taliban, and it's an opportunity for us to continue to press for the immediate and unconditional release of U.S. nationals in Afghanistan, including those who we have determined to be wrongfully detained. We'll also use those opportunities to directly talk about the Taliban's commitments to counterterrorism. And of course, as always, human rights is also on the agenda. Rabia, Thank you very go much. Ahead. Thank you very much. Do you have anything on uh, the talks between Turkey and the US, uh, uh, US energy firm ExxonMobil? The Turkish uh, energy minister said that they are interested in diversifying Turkey's uh, national National, national gas supplies. Uh, what is your comment on this? And was this, uh, you know, a topic of discussion between the two countries? Uh, so I, I don't have any more specifics to offer as it relates to the secretary's engagement with Foreign Minister Fidan, but let me just say, I, I've seen those public reports um, and I'm not gonna uh, offer anything additional on potential commercial negotiations. But uh, from our vantage point, we would encourage uh, any country to diversify its energy supply and curb uh, dependence on Russian energy. And to, to just broaden the aperture a little bit, uh, Turkey has played a very important role uh, as the host of the Southern Gas Corridor in helping diversify European energy uh, supplies and European gas supplies away from dependence on Russia. And as the host of multiple LNG liquefaction facilities, um, which have received a lot of American LNG since the beginning of Russia's uh, full-scale invasion in Ukraine. Can I have a quick one on Middle East? Sure. Uh, do you have any uh, comment on the Hamas and Fatah leaders meeting in Beijing at the invitation of China? What, what is your comment on dialogue between Hamas So our, China? Our, our, our message on this has been um, what it was since uh, October 7th. Uh, if any country purports to have um, uh, influence uh, or relationships uh, with Hamas, uh, the message is quite clear. Uh, release every single hostage and uh, it can no longer be uh, business as usual. Uh, they should call on Hamas to lay down their arms um, and that is the best and fastest way uh, to get us where we need to be. Taka, go ahead. So the um, family of the Japanese nationals abducted by North Korea met state official this morning. Do you have any detail about the meeting? Who met the families? And how did you discover the meeting? So I'm happy to uh, check if there's um, any specific officials that we can share, but the U.S. stands with the long-suffering relatives of Japanese abductees, and we continue to urge the DPRK to right this historic wrong and provide full accounting of those that remain missing. And we don't have any other uh, meetings on this to, to announce at this time. Details? I, I, I'm happy to check some more specifics, but I don't have anything for you at that. Go ahead, DR. Uh, thank you, Veran. Uh, yeah. you, you talked about the Kurdistan region election, yeah. but I need a clarification on that. What do you mean when you say that you encourage them to schedule a free and fair election because it's already been scheduled for June 10th? Does the U.S. support rescheduling that election? Our understanding is that uh, President Barzani and various other authorities are uh, actively considering <clears throat> next steps, and we will let that process play out before uh, commenting. Do you further. support rescheduling this election? That's not for uh, for us to decide. Uh, what we would encourage is for uh, these elections uh, to be scheduled and for them to be free, fair, and credible. But beyond that, our understanding is that President Barzani and various other entities are uh, actively discussing additional next steps. Go ahead. Sir, yeah. uh, Pakistani ambassador in Washington, D.C., Sardar Masood Khan, uh, recently talked about the importance of Pakistan-U.S. security cooperation and the need to bluster Pakistan's defense capabilities due to regional challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any something uh, to tell us uh, what kind of strategies or initiatives both of our countries are working out to enhance security cooperation? Yeah, so the United States and Pakistan have a shared interest in um, combating threats to regional security, and we support Pakistan's efforts to combat terrorism and ensure the safety and security of its citizens in a manner that 
promotes the rule of law and uh, protection of human rights. Our partnership with Pakistan on security issues includes, of course, a high-level counterterrorism dialogue, um, funding robust counterterrorism capacity, and building programs and supporting a series of U.S. and Pakistan military-to-military -military engagements. The Washington Post's uh, latest article revealed that Indian Prime Minister Modi inner circle, including spy chief Saman Goyal, and even the National Security Advisor were aware of the assassination plot on a Sikh activist in New York. So how concerning is this for you? So we continue to expect uh, accountability from the government of India based on the results of the Indian uh, inquiry committee's work and we are regularly uh, working with them and inquiring for additional updates. We'll also continue to raise our concerns directly with the Indian government at senior levels, uh, but beyond that I'm not going to uh, parse into this further and we'll defer to the Department of Justice. Julia, go ahead. Uh, on Sudan, I want to uh, follow up yeah. on the UN Ambassador uh, Thomas Greenfield's comments calling it a, a, the potential for a large-scale massacre. Um, and she also said that the U.S. is appealing to countries, including the UAE, to stop support for the warring parties. Um, have, has any progress been made with the UAE and other countries? And what is the U.S. doing to try to prevent this catastrophe? So um, to put it bluntly, as Ambassador Thomas Greenfield said yesterday, this we certainly do not view this as uh, conjecture. And we are seeing the possibility of history uh, repeating itself in Darfur in the worst possible way. There are credible reports that the RSF and its allied militias have raised multiple villages west of El Fasher and are planning an imminent attack on El Fasher, putting 500,000 internally displaced persons at risk on top of the 2 million Sudanese who call El Fasher home. Um, we also know, as the ambassador said, that both sides are receiving weapons and other support to fuel their efforts. And we've directly raised our concerns uh, about reports of UAPE support to the RSF with our Emirati partners. And we have made clear that the provision of arms to either side only deepens and uh, prolongs the conflict. Um, go ahead, Daphne, and then we're going to wrap. Uh, thank you. you. Said you said uh, that's not what I said. I said I would get to as many people as I, I'd get, I said I'd get to as many as I can. Go ahead, Daphne. Uh, the Philippines today said a Coast Guard ship and a fisheries vessel were damaged by water cannons used by Chinese Coast Guard ships. This comes uh, right after Blinken's trip to China. Do you have any comments on this? So the repeated harassment of Philippine vessels near Scarborough Reef um, is detrimental to regional peace and stability. And our belief is that the Chinese Coast Guard installation of these uh, barriers also endangers uh, Philippine uh, fisher folks' livelihoods and prevents them from exercising their legal rights to fish in those waters. These are rights that were set out in 2016 uh, in a final and legally binding judgment in the uh, Philippines-China arbitration brought to uh, the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. Uh, and consistently, and this is something that the Secretary made clear on his travels as well, is that we urge the PRC to uh, respect the navigational rights and freedoms guaranteed to all states under international law. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.